I feel something in my spirit for you that I want you to grab a hold of. That I feel in this last and closing hour, you've got to grab a hold of it. And I believe what we heard last night has got to happen before we can grab a hold of things like what we're going to hear today and no doubt what we're going to hear tonight from Brother Shaw. There's got to be repentance. There's got to be a place where we can get on our face and say, God created me a clean heart and renewing me a right spirit because I want all that you have for me. I want to be what you want me to be. I desire to do what you want me to do. Not that I be glorified, but that you be made manifest in this hour, that you be glorified in this last and closing hour. Praise God. Look at your neighbors. I'm going to get it today. Amen. You got to be determined. Praise the Lord. We're going to go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And we're going to begin at verse 1. Did anybody enjoy the, enjoy the message last night from Brother Shaw? Praise God. And it says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they carried unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, paralyzed couldn't get around on his own which was born of four and when they could not come nigh unto him look at your neighbor and say it wasn't easy when they could not come nigh unto him for the press they uncovered the roof where he was and when they had broken it up say when they did some work they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. In that time, if you had a disease like that, it was probably something that you'd done wrong that got you to that place is what was believed. But there was certain scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts why doth this man why doth this man do why doth this man do thus speak blasphemy who can forgive sin but God only and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning within themselves he said unto them why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easy to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house and immediately somebody say immediately immediately he arose took up the bed and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God saying we never saw it on this fashion we've never seen anything like this before praise God bow your heads put your Bibles or your iPhone to your Androids down and lift your hands to Jesus Christ God we magnify your name we praise your name. Lord, I ask specifically for a blood covering to sweep over this congregation right now. These students, every student, every student leader, every youth pastor, every pastor that is representing the church here today. Lord, would you cover in your blood? Lord, I am hungry for more of you. I am hungry for a generation that desires to get somewhere with you and receive what you have for them and to experience what your word declares that they can do and they can have. In the name of Jesus, cover us in your blood. We exalt your name. We magnify your name. Would you give God a hand clap of praise right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Studies have stated that your generation, Generation Z, can be characterized as a generation that experiences feelings of being unsettled and insecure. Generation Z knows the true value of independence, and knowledge is no exception there. If a Generation Z or knows they are capable of learning something themselves or through a more efficient way, non-traditional route, you can bet that they're going to do that. Somebody say amen. If you can do it an easier way, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to get to it. That is what your generation says. Millennials remember playing solitaire. Can I get some amen from the committee over here? Bouncing cards. So much fun. Coming home to the dial-up internet and using AOL. I don't know anything about all that. Somebody say amen. When you, when you used to go home and you want to get on the internet, it, it was like a, it took some time. I mean, you, you fix lunch, you, because you knew that you're going to have to eat and you're going to have to drink something before that internet finally connected. You sit down and you put your password in, your username, and you push enter, and then bing, bing, and you grab a bite of your sandwich, drink some Coke, and continues on. And finally, welcome. And you're in the internet interface. Generation Z was born into a world overrun with technology. What was once taken as amazing and inspiring inventions are now taken as a given to you. If I can't get it, if it can't happen fast enough, I don't want to have anything to do with it. When it doesn't get there fast, they think something is wrong. If I can't get it right now, what is going on? It's been, and I'll just go ahead and let you know that your generation and what has happened in your generation is affecting my generation. Since we've walked into this building on Wednesday night, we have gotten upset about internet speed. We have, we have said, what is going on? We have walked from this end to that end, trying to make sure we could connect and get there faster. And I heard two people yesterday say, this internet is ticking me off. Why? Because we want it now. We want it fast. We want it to get here this very moment. Today, I'm going to speak to you on this topic, their faith. Look at your neighbor and say, their faith. Their faith. I want to take a moment and just talk to you about some of these things, about faith in general, about some things about faith. What do you know about faith? What do I know about faith? Well, a very simple thing that I found out when you just start researching it. Faith is mentioned in the Word of God 336 times not very overwhelming, not awe-inspiring, but 336 times it's mentioned in the Bible. Paul said this about faith in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11 and 1 defines faith this way. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now get this, simply put, the biblical definition of faith is trusting in something you cannot explicitly proof. The definition of faith contains two aspects, intellectual approval and trust. Intellectual appro approval is believing something to be true. Trust is actually relying on the fact that that something is true. Intellectual approval is recognizing that a light switch, you see on the screen there, is actually a light switch and agreeing that it is designed to turn lights on or to turn them off. Trust, however, is actually walking over to the wall where the light switch sits and turning that light switch on. I know that it's a light switch. I know that it was invented and it was designed to turn lights on. I know that. I got the knowledge of that. But actually, knowing that it works, 
actually, not, you proving it to yourself is walking over there and flipping the light switch on. Somebody say amen. amen. Understanding these two aspects of faith is critical. Many people believe that certain facts about, or certain facts about Jesus. Many people will intellectually agree with the facts in the Bible that are declared about Jesus Christ. But knowing those facts to be true is not what the Bible means by faith. The biblical definition of faith requires intellectual approval and the fact or the trust in those facts. Someone shout faith. Look at your neighbor and say faith. Faith, something else that I learned about faith. Faith is not something you can buy off a Walgreens shelf. You're not going to be able to go to your local supermarket and pick up faith like you pick up an orange and put it in your basket. It's not going to happen that way. You cannot go to your local fishing, boy, uh, fishing hole, country boys, and cast out your lure and, and bring it in and, and, and look, oh, there's faith. I caught some faith. You can't catch faith. Faith is not contagious. Faith is not something that, it's not like the flu. If, if you got the flu you're gonna, and you rub up against somebody else, I'm going to get faith. That's not, you can't get faith that way. Faith is an, ex, an experience that is born in you. Somebody shout amen. amen. Students, you can know the Bible. Hear me right now. You can know the Bible from the very front cover to the very back cover. You can know everything that is in the word of God, but that is not faith. Faith is when you are in an impossible situation. It is staring you in the face. Darkness is all around you, but you walk over to the light switch and you say, I know you're God. I know you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or even think. I know that you can help me in this situation, but I'm not okay with just knowing it. I've got all these problems staring me in the face. I've got all these situations that are in my mind and in my heart and in my family. I know that the book says you can make a way when there seemeth to be no way. I've heard my preacher preach it a thousand times, and I've even seen other people experience what you can do. I know you can do it. That's not faith. Faith is actually placing your own trust. Your own trust in what he can do. It's easy to shout, yeah, he can do it for you, but then all hell breaks loose in your life or all kinds of situations stare you in the face and darkness is looming over you. It's altogether different when you gotta walk over to the wall and turn the light switch on for yourself. Is it gonna work? Is it going to happen? You gotta make up in your mind, I'm gonna get over there and I'm gonna turn that light switch on. I know you can do it, God, but I believe you can do it for me. In our scripture text that we read about the four young men, we don't know a lot about them. We don't know where they come from. We, we, the Bible doesn't tell us their pedigree. It doesn't tell us how long they were in church or how long they had believed and had faith. We know that these men knew about Jesus. They knew what he was capable of. There's no doubt in my mind that any kind of smart person could come to that conclusion, you can determine that, and this is the reason why, is because first, they tried to get to him any way possible. If you don't know that there's somebody in there that has the answer to your situation, then you're just gonna be like everybody else and just kinda looking around. But these men knew, they had heard, they'd, they had been told, it had been noise to brawl, the Bible says, and they knew what he was capable of. They knew what was possible with Jesus. They knew that, that there's got to be a way to get to him, and they had tried every way. The Bible declares to us that they did. And when they couldn't get through the door, and when they couldn't get through the windows, maybe they went to the back side of the house. I don't know exactly what went through their brain. They, they tried every way, and finally they just started looking up. Studies that I show, they or looked at and, and read through it, talked about it. in those days the houses were flat and they, had, they actually had ladders. I don't know if that's to be true. I have no idea. Just reading commentary. But it, it said that, the, that they were flat and some houses had ladders and steps that went up to them. So they made a, oh, let's get up there. 
and I saw over somebody's shoulder that he's probably right here in this region. He's right over here in this area. And so what did they do when they couldn't get to him any other way? They said, we're going to tear the roof off. We're going to destroy what is in our way. Which, friend, it brings us to another point about faith. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. There's sometimes you can believe all what you want to and say, I have faith all you want to, but you got to start stepping toward the light switch. You got to start walking towards the wall. You got to do whatever it takes to get to the power. I want to get to the light switch. I'm not interested in hearing about what the light switch can do for you. I already know that. I'm not interested in watching what the light switch can do for you. I already know that. I'm not interested in you turning the light switch on for me. I want to go and turn the light switch on for myself. I want to place my own trust in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I got faith. I know what he can do, but I want to have faith for me. And I am going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get my answer. Hallelujah. Matthew 17 and 20 says this about faith. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Recently, I heard a story about the mustard seed, and I, so I went to Google, you know, because Google knows everything. Anything you ask her or, or it, it'll give you an answer. And so I began to research. And what I found out about a mustard seed, a mustard seed is the only seed that will not cross-pollinate. I had no idea. I heard it, and I was like, what? That's not true. And so I went and researched it. And so a mustard seed, it will not cross-pollinate with any other seed. You, you, you can plant it with anything. You can plant it with what, whatever other seed that you want to, right beside each other, but a mustard seed plant is going to come forth it will not cross-pollinate. And I believe that the men in the Word of God in Mark that we read about today, they had an understanding of this on that day. They had some knowledge of that this day. The Bible says you need to have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed. When I was a little kid, and no disrespect to any Sunday school teacher that I ever had, I remember we got a white piece of paper and we'd get some glue and we'd put that glue on that mustard seed, glue all over our fingers, and we'd stick it right there and wait till it dries, and then we'd write faith above it. That's all you need. All you all gotta have is that mustard seed faith. And I know I Sister Billy Martin, God love her and rest her soul. I love her very much. And and, and Sister uh, Nadine Woods and other ones at my church that taught me all those things, that's great and that's wonderful. But it's not about the size, it's about the type of faith. And these men understood that it's the type of faith that we have. And I, I have faith. I know that he can do great things. I know he's capable of doing these things. And so they said this, I have faith. I know what he can do, but it's not going to be easy. I can't get through him through the window. We've tried to plant our faith. We've tried to plant our faith through the window, and we can't do it there. We've tried to plant our faith through the door, and there's too many people packed into the house. We've tried to plant our faith on the back porch, but there's too many people packed there, and we can't get through the double doors. We can't get through the sliding glass door, and so what are we going to do? Well, they did exactly what you do when you go plant any type of seed. They walked up on top of that roof, and the Bible, it talks about they began to tear the roof off. When you study that uh, about this particular, these particular roofs, they were tile roofs, and then there was mud, and there's pitch, and all these different things. And so they began to prepare a hole like you would for a seed. They had mustard seed faith. And they said, let's begin to dig this away. Let's begin to make a hole here. Let's begin to open this place up, and, and then we will plant with our mustard seed faith our paralyzed brother. Our brother that's hurting, 
with our mustard seed faith, we will plant him through this hole in the roof. Why? Because they knew that if they planted it with their mustard seed faith, they knew that there was going to be a great harvest. He's not going to come out anything but healed. He's not going to come out anything but made whole because when you have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed and you plant it with something that is broken, you plant it with something that is hurting, you plant it with something that can't move, if you'll put it down in the ground, it's going to come up faith every single time. They knew if they planted it with mustard seed faith, faith always wins. Somebody shout faith wins. How many of you know scriptures in the word of God other than the one that we read today about healings and miracles? Anybody? You've read scriptures about miracles and healings and signs and wonders? Praise God. How many of you know that Jesus is healed? Have you seen him heal? Anybody in the house? I'm going to raise your hand. I know it's class participation. It's hard sometimes. Now, I'm going to need some good class participation now. How many of you have a mom that is lost out with God or maybe has never even known Jesus in the power of the Holy Ghost? I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you to remain standing, please. How many of you have a dad that doesn't know Jesus in the power of the Holy Ghost or has never known him in the power of the Holy Ghost before? Maybe backslidden. Stand to your feet. Please remain standing. How many of you know someone that is depressed? Right now, you know that a friend or a family member is depressed. I want you to stand to your feet. <laughs> How many of you know someone that is brokenhearted and it overwhelms them every single day? Every single day, they're overwhelmed with being brokenhearted. They can't get past it. They can't get over it. <sighs> Just look across this congregation. Please remain standing. I'm hurrying. I'm not going to be very much longer. How many of you have, if you need to raise a hand, you can. How many of you have heard your pastor say, we're going to have revival? Or you've heard your youth pastor say, we're going to have revival in our church. We are going to experience revival, but maybe it hasn't happened. Like you said, it's going to happen yet. Anybody? You've kind of got there, but you're not there yet. Listen to what our text said in Mark 2 and verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, <laughs> when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He didn't need his sins forgiven. Just for what he was trying to relate to these people. I know that you know that he's done something wrong, so his sin be forgiven thee. I want you to understand what I'm saying right now. The Bible says that he was, he was made whole, or his sins were forgiven thee, and then he was healed, and it was for no other reason but their faith. It was no other reason, but he didn't, he didn't acknowledge them any other way. I can see him looking through the roof, and he says, because of their faith, not how you do, and y'all did a good job of acknowledging you, and, and I don't really care how hard you work. There was nothing like that. He just told him, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. The Bible also tells us, please remain standing, greater works than these shall ye do. The miracles that need to happen, the miracles that you stood up that you really would love to happen, there's someone, there's a mom, there's a dad, there's a friend, there's a coworker, there's somebody that is waiting on you. Hear me, friend. I'm not preaching just to get you excited. I'm preaching to tell you something. You are a great generation. This world and these people in this world and whatever, Forbes and other people that have done studies about you, let me tell you something. Generation Z has some flaws or whatever, but I'm talking to a generation. If you'll continue to do what we heard about last night and come before the Lord and say, create in me a clean heart, prepare me to do what you want me to do in your kingdom. You can walk in the spirit. You can have the type of faith that says, I don't care what it takes. 
But let me tell you something. Your mom that you cry about on a weekly basis, your mom that you bring a prayer request to the pastor or the youth pastor or the assistant pastor every week and say, I want my mom saved. She's waiting on you. Your dad is waiting on you. Your friend is waiting on you. These miracles are not waiting on the generation that you see on the screen right now that are consumed by their smartphones, seeing what they can do on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. That is not what they're waiting on. They're not waiting on Generation Z. They're waiting on a generation that wants to tear off a roof. They're waiting on a generation that wants to do some work. They're waiting on a generation that says, I'm not worried about getting it easy. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to get on my face. I know you can do it, God. I've heard about you doing it, but I want you to do it for my dad. I want you to do it for my mom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to turn the light switch on. I'm going to do some work. I'm going to dig up the roof. I'm going to tear the tiles off. I'm going to do whatever it takes. If anything stands in my way, I'm going to work through it until I get to the power. Musicians, if you had come. I don't care how long it takes. I am in this until I get what I want. I'm telling you, as I read about Generation Z, some really cool stuff about you. But it said that if you can't get it in a certain amount of time, you give up on it. Or you go to something else. If it can't happen right now, I don't really want to have anything to do with it. If I can't have it my way, then I don't want it. Let me tell you something. God doesn't work how we want him to work. He works how he wants to work. But your mom is counting on you. Your daddy is counting on you. Your friend that is depressed and brokenhearted is counting on you. And friend, let me tell you something. You can succeed because the word of God declares it. The word of God says greater works than these shall ye do. You're going to do the greater works, but you got to be willing to get your hands dirty on top of the roof. you got to be willing to cut your fingers up and say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to believe. And I know that you are able. Student, this is what I want. I know it's going to be different, different transition than most. But hear me right now. I want you to come to this altar. Hold on. I'm going to give you some instructions. I want you to come to this altar, and I want you to make a commitment to work. I'm going to work. I'm going to get my hands dirty. I'm not just going to say, yeah, I know the light switch works. I know that's what it was invented for. I know it's capable of turning the lights on. No. I'm going to be okay with walking over here to the wall. I'm going to be okay with putting in some effort to go and turn that light switch on myself because I want to see my mom saved. I want to see my dad saved. I want miracles to be wrought in my hands, not that I get the glory, but that God gets the glory. Here's a man that just passed away, a pillar of faith, a man that carried the gospel. There's been many of them through the years. My father, just the other night at prayer meeting, was talking to one of his friends and said, who's going to take people's place like these pillars of faith that have come and now they're gone? And his friend and him, they, or my father said, well, it's going to be us. It's going to be us that's going to do it. Just standing up against the wall by one of our bathrooms in the prayer room, my heart just began to beat. There's got to be a generation that's got to do what my grandfather did. And they can't just be whatever's easy. I know we got technology at our fingertips. I know we can get it right now. I know if it doesn't come fast enough, we give up on it. But let me tell you what you can't give up on, friends. You can't give up on mama. You can't give up on daddy. You can't give up on that individual that needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can't give up on your school, friends. Your school's not too big. If you get dirty... If you'll do some work, if you'll be willing to tear away and plant with your faith, greater works than these shall ye do.
They're going to receive the Holy Ghost. They're going to be transformed. Their mind is going to be renewed. Your mom is going to come to church. She is going to receive the Holy Ghost. Your dad is going to come to church. He is going to receive the Holy Ghost. But you got to be willing to tear off the roof. So again, what I want you to do today is I want you to come to an altar. We cried. We repented. We said, Lord, creating us clean hearts, renewing us right spirits last night. What I want you to do today is start making a commitment that I'm going to work. When I get home, I'm not just going to go to church and just listen to pastor and say, oh, that's good. I know that. That's good. So, no, I'm going to, I'm going to prove it for myself. I say I have faith, but I'm going to actually have faith in you. I say that you're capable of doing that, but I'm actually going to put my money where my mouth is, and I'm going to do the work. to get the results that your word says I can have. These altars are open right now. I want you to make your way up here and I want you to begin to seek the face of God and say, Lord, I will commit to work. I'm gonna have to pray more than I ever have. I may have to fast and deny the flesh, but I'm gonna do whatever it takes. I don't care what stands in my way. I don't care if somebody else is in front of me. You heard about dreams today. You heard about different lessons today with Brother Flowers. Let me tell you something. You have gotta make a commitment to work. You got a commitment to believe. Make a commitment to believe. You gotta make a commitment to get your hands dirty. Whatever it takes, Lord. I'm going to study the show myself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to know the word of God frontwards and backwards, but I'm going to place my faith in this word. I'm going to turn the light switch on. I'm going to turn the light switch on because my mom is worth it. My dad is worth it. My friend that is depressed is worth it. And I want to be a part of revival. Come on, the revival at your church is waiting.